Hello, dear viewers, and welcome to our program Civil Society, which will be hosted by me, Nicholas Mjavanadze. We are seeing several activists protesting in front of the administrative building of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. They are holding banners, mainly supporting Georgi Rurua. Here we are seeing one of the banners that says Georgi Rurua is a political prisoner. And another one displaying photo images of police officers who are also involved in the case of Georgi Rurua. According to these young protesters, the main message of this rally is that Georgi Rurua is a political prisoner and this is recognized not only in Georgia but also abroad. Also, they claim that it is unacceptable to detain Georgi under the given circumstances where there is not even a single piece of evidence confirming that the firearm involved in the case truly belonged to him. Let us talk directly to the rally organizers, shall we? What is the main message you are trying to bring across by protesting in front of the Ministry of Internal Affairs? There are political prisoners in this country, and one of them is Georgi Rurua. It has been recognized not only in Georgia, but also by our partners in the international community. He has been jailed simply because he is a shareholder of the main TV channel, and he was actively involved in the protest rallies. Therefore, Ivanishvili decided to get rid of him by merely fabricating a case and planting a firearm. Yes, dear friends, many are familiar with Georgi Rurua, also nicknamed as Jorika Rurua. The previous government during Saakashvili's rule very much relied on Georgi and his brother. Now, as we speak of Georgi Rurua and his arrest, I'm sure many have remembered the Toraza family case and how they were murdered. Here we are looking at the photograph of the entire family, five brothers, four sisters, along with their mother and father. Many remember this horrifying tragedy unfold back in February 1992. 28 years ago, the Toraza brothers, Lasha, Gaha, Emedo and their friends ended up clashing in a confrontation with Hedrioni a gang-type military formation founded by then-existing government. As a result, the brothers were wounded. On March 3, 1992, Father Zawur Toradze, Mother Izo Kruhuli Toradze and Lasha were returning home after one of their visits to a doctor for Lasha's wound treatment. All three members of the family were gunned down in their family car near Vera Cemetery. Now we're looking at the picture of mother and father of Toradze family. Then afterwards, the armed group surrounded the Toradze family house. They stormed inside the house and shot two unarmed brothers, Gaha and Imedo, in front of their sisters and neighbors that were there at the time. After that, tragedy continued with Zaza Toradze being picked up and taken away to some other location and most likely murdered as well as his whereabouts are not known to this day. Two years later, 17-year-old Pata Toraza also disappeared. He was kidnapped and most likely murdered as his whereabouts are also not known. That is five brothers, along with their mother and father, killed in this horrible tragedy. Many people talk about these difficult times where we have lived through, and it indeed was the hardest period. Tamara Toradze will be telling us all about this in a detailed interview, how the whole process developed and how her brothers Imedo and Gaha Toradze were shot and killed in front of her eyes. They crashed into the room holding machine guns. Jorik Arurua pointed his gun at Kaha. Kaha immediately stepped in front of Imedo trying to protect his younger brother, grabbed the gun directed at him and exclaimed, Hey, we're not armed, what are you doing? Hoping to stop the armed man. At this point, Jorik Aruru and the other tall guy opened fire at both of my brothers. There was smoke everywhere in the small room. I could only hear my voice. 
and seeing Kaha covering Imedo and screaming, don't shoot him. And then I saw both of them on the floor. I was looking more at Kaha for some reason, probably because he stood closer to me than Imedo. Then Rurua took a handgun and aimed it at all of us, like this, and stared us all down. Once he realized there was no more men left, and only my sisters, he took his gun and shot the already dead Kaha another few times. The other guy finished the medal by shooting him too. And they left the room. And as they ran, I could hear some more shots. And I guess that was their way of celebrating the murder. Dear friends, let me remind you that this is an exclusive interview. Tamara has never spoken about this in any television show nor to any media outlets. The objective viewers now have the opportunity to learn all the details of the tragedy directly from Tamara, the primary source. Before the terrible events took place, the family had a happy and contented life. Let us take a glance at some footage taken from a video of the Toraza family and how they lived then, where you'll see Tamara at only 13 years old. Where's the other little girl go? You're coming. Yeah, they're very pretty. Have, what number is this boy? Uh, Madame is the sixth. Okay. He smile. He has such a big smile. Look at the big smile. Seven, eight, nine. Do they know any English at all? She gives that English at quatre, man. Hello? 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 Hello, yes. Very good, very good. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> All of this was filmed a year before the destruction of the family. These little children are going to watch their brothers Imedo and Kaha Toradze being murdered by Jorika Rua and his gang. As far as we know, this video was filmed by some American cameraman where you can see little Tamara. Here is some more footage filmed during this visit where we see the entire family sharing their joy that was so frequently present in the house. Good, good, good. 
And now we're going to move on to the promise interview. Let me remind you again that no one has ever spoken about this on television and Tamara will be talking exclusively to us for the first time. Greetings Nicholas. Thank you so much for the invitation and sparing airtime for me allowing me to talk about this harrowing subject that has haunted me for the past 28 years. As for my parents, they were sincere and decent people. My father was a government official, a deputy minister in a trading department. My mother, as far as, as I remember, managed a farmer's market, but before that she worked for a government institution. For her last two years, she became a housewife and was occupied with the family. She was busy looking after us all. Mom and Dad were both quite strict. It was hard to control so many children as there were nine of us, so they did their best to raise us in a strict and disciplined environment by grounding us, telling us right from wrong and so on. My siblings and I also raised each other. We tried to help our parents a lot. We lived an active life and exercise was a usual routine for us. No one in the family did drugs. My parents did not smoke, but three of my brothers did and that was a big problem because a healthy lifestyle was necessary in the family. Dad was very organized, therefore we all had to be organized as well. There had to be strict discipline at home. It could not have been otherwise. Of course, mom and dad were warm and affectionate too. We had very loving parents. My dad was also an honest man, to such extent that he never accepted any bribes from anyone. So some people became his enemies. I've even heard from many that despite refusing a bribe, he would still help people. For instance, if a man's store had to be closed down for whatever reason, then he would help to keep it open. He gained many friends through that. That was typical life in Tbilisi at that time. It probably still is to this day. He was also afraid of doing something that could bring harm to his family. I'm sure that he would never endanger his own family as we meant everything to him absolutely everything. We were nine siblings, five brothers and four sisters. The eldest was 26 and the youngest was six at the time, I mean in 1992 when this all happened. The eldest brother Zaza was married for the second time and lived separately. The other brother Gaha also had a wife but he was separated during that time. So the rest of us all lived together. The eldest, 26 years old, Zaza, was working probably. I don't have a recollection of what he was doing. Kaha and Lasha were students and went to college. Imeda was about to graduate from school and go to college too. We were all engaged in sports and very passionate about it, apart from Imedo, and my family were quite upset about this. My father made sure that all of us, including the girls, were involved in some kind of sports activity. We even did karate, track running and things like that. I'm sure everyone remembers what a messed up place Tbilisi was at the time. 
My brothers would go out and do their mischievous boy-like things, but they would also stand up for the other people in trouble. My parents didn't like it, and I remember regular arguments about this. Things were happening outside my family, but I'm sure my brothers didn't steal, kill or harm anyone in any way. They wouldn't do anything to embarrass their family. In the 90s, the situation in Georgia became tense, and things got worse in our family too. It was in summer of 91 when the first severe attack on my family took place. I still don't know whether they were the enemies that my father had or the ones that my brothers gained from the streets. We were at home and a boy was calling Imedo to come outside. Imedo went out and Kaha followed him. Then this guy pulls out a gun, shoots Imedo and runs. Imedo got wounded in the shoulder. As I was watching this from the window, Kaha chased this guy and injured him too in a leg. But the attacker managed to get away by jumping into someone else's car, leaving his vehicle behind which he had parked in the yard earlier. Of course, my brothers wouldn't tell our parents much about the incident, so my father started to look into it and later on he found out that the owner of this car turned out to be a police officer and not some random guy from the streets. We couldn't understand what was happening. Very soon our house was surrounded by all sorts of law enforcement groups like the police and SWAT teams and other armed groups but not Pedrioni as they were not so much in control yet. The president then was Zviad Gamsahurdia and he was out of the country at the time. I remember this because my father was saying they are trying to do something unlawful while the president is out of the country. Let us wait until he gets back and we will find out what's going on. My dad took my wounded brother to the hospital and while they were there away, the police tried to enter our house. They were shouting all sorts of horrible things, for instance, your brothers were shot like pigs. I was standing behind the door scared and wouldn't open it for them. I told them to come back later when the adults are back. My father returned and somehow managed to get into the house. He called to arrange a meeting with the chief prosecutor named Borya Ivanov, who at the time was very influential and could resolve some important issues in a critical situations. Soon the prosecutor arrives, enters our house and apologizes for what had happened. Then he tells the police to behave and orders them to bring my brothers back. That was it. That's how that day ended. After some time, in September that year, my brothers came home looking visually anxious. I was playing outside when they told me to get home immediately, and I did. I always listened to them and never argued about anything. At home, I heard them talking to my dad. They were describing whatever had happened earlier. As they walked on Kalandaza Street, they were stopped by the gang from our neighborhood called Borotebi, which means the evils in English. These guys were older than my brothers, and I could tell that they didn't know them very well by the way they spoke about them. My brother said, they stopped us and told us that we were bothering one of their friends. We wanted them to tell us who the friend was, but before they could even start the conversation, one of the gang members, Larry Sulaberidze, punched Imedo, then Lasha hit Larry, so a fight broke out. One of them took a gun out and started shooting, 
Then another man started shooting as well, and everyone ran. So the brothers were telling dad this story and trying to decide what was going to happen next. Not long after, a couple of guys familiar to my brothers appeared in the house. Pedro Karcivaze and someone else. They were discussing what had happened, saying that my brothers were right in this case, that they would make sure that those in the wrong would get punished and they will arrange a meeting the next day for both sides to talk. They told them that it was crucial to turn up unarmed and not act in anger to avoid any shooting. Here I have to mention that these are very unstable, messy and dangerous times in Georgia. My brothers didn't have a license for their weapons. My dad was strictly against it. He was a very law-abiding man, but at the same time he saw that the situation was getting out of control. My brothers would continuously explain to him that they had to keep the weapons to defend themselves. My dad was distraught about this all. My brothers kept telling him stories about Borotebi gang and all of the things they have done in the neighborhood and how dangerous they were towards them. My father was getting increasingly worried and started to say things like, all of this violence is well planned and thought through. It's a trap. We need to leave the country as soon as possible or they will kill us all. My brothers would never listen or take it seriously. They were convinced that these people were looking to control the neighborhood, then Tbilisi and then the whole of Georgia. My brothers always thought differently, argued and never listened to my father. So this guy named Bedo or Berdia, whatever they called him, paid us a visit. He was more or less of a respected guy because his godfather was an all-famous gangster, Pata Chlaize. Also, my brothers knew him personally. These were the times when the gangsters were respected by almost everybody, whether they liked it or not. He came by to arrange a meeting between both sides and make things right. My brothers listened to him and agreed to meet up the next day at 11 o'clock near either Dry Bridge or the Round Square. Next morning, my brother Imedo phoned Berdia to make sure that they should be unarmed at the meeting. Berdia was almost offended by the question and told him that he wouldn't tolerate any of the sides disrespecting the no-gun agreement especially if that happened from the Borotebi side. So the meeting was arranged. As my brothers were about to leave the house, my father asked them not to go. He said, please don't go, but if you don't want to listen and do it your way, then at least some of you could stay at home so you don't get killed all at once. Surprisingly, my brothers agreed. Only Zaza and Imedo with their friends Viad Gilovani went. Kaha and Lasha stayed at home with Paata, the youngest brother. He was never involved in those problems anyway because he was too young then. Very soon we received a phone call informing us that my brothers had been taken to hospital and we needed to get there as quickly as possible. Now let me tell you what happened. After my brothers arrived at agreed location, Berdia proposed to go to a nearby flat. He suggested that it was going to be a family-like and friendly talk, so there would be no need to be outside. As soon as they approached the building block, 30 men with machine guns came out of the entrance, beat them down, put them into cars and drove them to woods in the Tkneti area. They dragged my brothers out of the cars and forced them to apologize for opposing them on Kalandaza Street. My brothers would not apologize, so they were shot in the legs. One guy named Georgi Ramishvili, a.k.a. Zarala, started shooting my brother's car, but his friend shouted, what are you wasting bullets for, as if the saving bullets was more important than anything else. Everything from the car was stolen, 
money, cassettes, tape recorder, even a lighter. They drove away and left my brothers to die. Zaza, unable to walk, crawled to find help, and luckily he found someone passing by, and that is how they survived, by pure chance. However, Borotebi gang particularly murdered my brothers and their friend that day. My father went and took the boys from the hospital. They continued to be treated at home in order for them to be safe. Soon some other gangsters started to visit our house, discussing what had happened and how cruel and unfair it was. My brothers were furious and never considered forgiveness. My father still believed that this was organized by someone above the Borotebi gang, and our family needed to escape the country. I'm still trying to understand whether these were my father's enemies or the actual Borotebi against my brothers. All I can say for now is that this was how it all developed. The situation in Georgia, especially in Tbilisi, was getting tenser and therefore worse for my family. People were running around with machine guns everywhere. My brothers felt humiliated after the incident. Their dignity has been taken away from them and they were too proud to get over it. It was hard for them to show their faces outside the house. You may ask why the police were not notified, but at that point no one knew who was defending the law. It was a chaos. It was impossible to understand who supported who. The corruption was everywhere. My father kept repeating that we needed to leave the country at once. I'm not sure whether he was still functional at his work, even though the Ministry of Trade still existed. My brothers were totally against escaping. They said, we can't let these people destroy and consume this country, we should fight back. Several military gang type formations started to appear at the time. My father was even suggested we join groups like Hedrioni or Guardia since they were legally allowed to carry weapons. Otherwise, my brothers could face being arrested for possessing illegal arms. But this was something incomprehensible for my brothers and the ideals they believed in. Groups like Hedrioni had a terrible reputation and they were continually committing crimes. My brothers tried to stay at home and not go out. Now it is February the following year. Paate Chlaize, the famous gangster, started to visit our house frequently. He came at least four times from what I recall. There is an audio recording on YouTube of their conversations that I managed to make in which he tried to convince my brothers to forget the conflict and forgive the others. Now let me play you a fragment of the audio recording that Tamara has mentioned. The tape was recorded a few days before the destruction of the family.
Unfortunately, they did end up in coffins. The events started to develop a little differently after this visit of Parada Chlaize. Pamuna Toraze will tell us all about it. Naturally, my brothers couldn't trust anyone anymore. They just didn't believe that Borotebi gang would consider Parada Chlaize and act on whatever he would suggest. Also, the question is, who were the Borotebi and who did they work for? I think Chlaize knew very well what my family was up against, and he pitied my brothers who were innocent and too young to die over this. He knew this wasn't a regular street conflict and that my brothers could not win this fight. Otherwise, he wouldn't have visited us so often to try and convince my brothers to forgive Borotebi gang and to be on good terms with them. In fact, he wouldn't bother to come at all. The problem was that the Borotebi wouldn't stop even if my brothers forgave them. The only option for us was to leave the country to survive. I don't believe that my brothers were victims of the streets. They haven't done anything wrong. This was a setup coming from above. Another thing was that Borotebi gang had too many members and my brothers were not familiar with all of their faces. They only knew the nicknames such as Zarala, Tilika, Gwaji, just to name a few because the list is too long. Some of them are not alive anymore, but I can assure you there were too many of them. Finally, my brothers decided to speak to the leader of the gang. His last name was Mgeladze. He was from the other neighborhood called Plato. My brothers planned to take him and make him talk about who Borotebi really were and what they wanted from the Toraza family. They went and parked their cars near his house and waited for Mgeladze to show up. Mgeladze and his people spotted them and the shooting began from all sides. The people were even shooting from the roof of the building. There were many of them. 
My brothers Gaha and Zaza and most of their friends got wounded in the cars. Some made it to the hospital, some not. Gaha phoned from the hospital and told us that they were wounded and also they didn't know what happened to Imedo and their friend Namtseta. It was a curfew during February 1992. People were not allowed to leave the house after a certain time or one could get shot by the military. But that couldn't stop my mother from going, so she rushed to the hospital. Next morning, Emedo phoned and said that he stayed at someone's house overnight. However, Namtesa was still missing. Later on, we found out that he was found dead somewhere on the street. He died from losing too much blood. His parents blamed our family and never stopped calling us and cursing. It was too hard for everyone, to the point that my mother even wished she had lost one of her sons instead of them losing theirs. We went through a lot of trouble and pain during that time. That pain won't go away, even to this date. Eventually, my brothers were taken from the hospital and continued their treatment at home for safety reasons. My father was still insisting on leaving the country. My brother's wounds were so severe that they couldn't guarantee if he was going to be able to use his arms and legs again. Zviad Gelovani, my brother's friend, was also wounded and was staying at home when Georgi, a.k.a. Jorika Rurua, apparently paid him a visit and forced him to reconcile with him under the gunpoint. Zviad Gelovani called my brothers explaining to them that he had no other choice but to do so, even though he didn't really reconcile with Jorika. He wanted to come and stay with my brothers, but my brothers refused and told him that their fate wasn't clear and it would be safer for Zviad staying at home to be on good terms with Rurua at least. This way my brothers saved his life. Afterwards, everything went to a more dramatic phase and the tensions reached its peak, leading to the end of the Toradze family. It was too dangerous to leave home, so the doctors would come to our house to treat my brother's wounds. Zaza started to feel a little bit better, although he struggled to walk on his own. He was taken to his wife's house. On the morning of March 3rd, the investigators came to our house. They were asking all sorts of questions. My brothers obviously wouldn't talk to them about the war they had with Borotebi. Everyone knew everything and this interrogation was a pure formality. At that time, the doctor phoned us, insisting on bringing Lasha to the hospital instead of having a home treatment. He said that he was in a rush and asked to arrive not later than one o'clock. The investigators left eventually. My mother was rushing my dad to go to the hospital so they were not late for the appointment. To which my dad responded, Please let me finish my cup of tea. Who knows this might be the last one I'm ever having. He kept saying things like, We need to leave the country. We are on the blacklist. That will definitely kill us all. Shevardnadze is coming. They don't want me to talk to him. I have the information on all of them. My brothers argued with him, saying that my dad was crazy and too scared, and now he was trying to scare the rest of the family. I didn't understand the seriousness of it all at the time, as the arguments carried on inside the family. All I could tell was that my parents were really worried. So they left the house and took Lasha to the doctor. In about 40 minutes we heard a non-stop shooting which lasted for about 10 to 15 minutes. We looked out of the windows in all directions but we were unable to see anything. We kept asking neighbors if anyone knew of what happened and eventually someone said that they shot the car with a number plate 111107. I realized that it was my father's car. Kaha almost jumped out of the window 
when he heard the terrible news. He tried to run out of the house when the neighbors stopped him and told us to tidy the room so they could bring in the dead bodies of my family members. We still couldn't understand or believe what was going on. My whole life came down crushing, but I kept tidying the room out of confusion. It is very hard for me to explain as everything happened in seconds. Kaha kept looking out of the window. All of a sudden he started shouting, everybody to the bathroom now. We had a big bathroom with a pool-like tub inside and he made us all jump into it. I guess this was the safest place as it didn't have any windows around. Imedo asked what happened when Gaha replied, these bastards arrived here with a military tank. By the way, the first president of Georgia, Zviad Gamsahurdia, predicted that our country was going to be overwhelmed with the events such as these. My departure, leaving my position, will lead to the establishment of several sub-states within Georgia. This I am saying without any exaggeration. Use your minds, people, especially this applies to the opposition. This will lead to the complete destruction of the state, total anarchy throughout the country and especially in Tbilisi. If this happens, then Tbilisi will be divided into several districts and neighborhoods where there will be only one government, armed gangs and their leaders. There will be an armed competition for power and influence. People will be robbed and raided and everything will be destroyed. Yes, this is exactly what happened at the end. Unfortunately, there are still people out there to this day who would like to go back and live in 90s Georgia. Tamara also has published a book about this tragedy, which should be a signal for such people to understand what 90s meant for this country and why we should not get back there. We will continue to tell this story in our second episode of our program next Friday at 7.30 p.m. See you next time.